My topic this evening is called Murray Rothbard, Go and Do Thou Likewise. If you don't mind, I'm going to do what men of my age do from time to time, that is tell you war stories, usually insufferably boring for younger people, but occasionally enlightening if you find that perhaps you're going through a similar trial. I want to talk about my own situation in 1961, 62, 63, when I was an undergraduate. It was a difficult time for those of us who were conservatives or libertarians because we did not have lots of publications, didn't have magazines, did not have much. And if we were on a college campus, we were pretty much alone. But there were newsletters from time to time, or there might be a tabloid from time to time. We would find out bits and pieces of intelligent material that was being produced by people who did not think that the expansion of the state was a positive aspect of modern civilization. And every once in a while, I would come across the name of Murray Rothbard, usually in a short piece of some kind, short essay, in an obscure newsletter that I have certainly forgotten by now, but Murray was generous enough to donate his time because he rarely got any money to do it. And I began to realize that there was a unique fellow out there who spoke very clearly, very much directed to the issues of the day. Many topics, politics and economics, certainly issues of philosophy and moral philosophy. So I knew he was there, but I had not met him. And at that stage, I could not read much of what he had written because it was confined mostly to a few academic journals I was not familiar with and to newsletters to which, as an undergraduate, I did not subscribe. Then, in 1962, through the generosity of the man who funded Man, Economy, and State, an economist named F.A. Harper, known as Baldy, who was not bald, I was sent a copy of a brand new two-volume work, Man, Economy, and State. Now, I was aware of Mises and I was aware of Hayek because, like most of the people who came to a libertarian position in my day, someone had handed me a copy of The Freeman, which in that era was about the only way any younger person or any average person learned about the free market economy. And so from the Freeman, I had learned about Mises and I had learned about Hayek and I had bought human action and I had bought, at that stage, I had bought uh, Hayek's Constitution of Liberty and I was struggling to get through them and it was not my major and so I did it on a part-time basis. And in the summer of 1963, I got the best job I've ever had and ever expect to have. I got a job where I was paid the equivalent in today's money of $3,000 a month to sit at a desk and read Murray Rothbard and Ludwig von Mises. <laughs> never had a job like that and never expect to have a job like that again. So for three months in the summer of 1963, I read. I read a lot of what Mises wrote. I read every book that Rothbard had written. I wrote a great deal of Rupke's material. I read a great deal of Hayek's material. It was a wonderful, wonderful summer. Now understand what had happened. In 1962, early 62, there was no book by Murray Rothbard. By the summer of 63, there was a two-volume Man, Economy, and State. There was the 350 or thereabouts page monograph on America's Great Depression. And there was his doctoral dissertation on the Panic of 1819, which was our first depression. 
Understand, this is within a period of approximately 12 months that this material appeared. And at that point, I knew I was dealing with something certainly on the the far edge of the bell-shaped curve. (laughs) So what I want to talk about is, is not so much my personal war stories, but I want to talk about Murray Rothbard's war stories. Because the farther back you go, the smarter and more creative you'd better be. Because there was no support. There was no body of literature to which you could go. Now, each generation has its own responsibilities. And each generation has its own gifts and resources. The greater your resources, the greater your responsibilities. And if you forget that, you will not understand why you are here. You have this tremendous ability that you can walk into any of these rooms just of the publications of the Mises Institute, and if you bought everything on the shelves, you would be a busy beaver for the next year. And then if you go beyond that to the Liberty Fund, and if you go beyond that now to some of the better university presses, your library will cover shelf upon shelf of materials defending the concept to one degree or other that let us shrink the state. There weren't shelves upon shelves of books in 1956 when Murray Rothbard got his doctoral dissertation finished. You did not have this enormous body of literature. And if you were going to do something of a really creative nature, you had to spin it out of your own entrails, as Rothbard did. So let's talk about what I see as his accomplishments. First, conceptual. That is his intellectual legacy that he has left to us. He put Mises' economics into a structured, organized, and readable pattern. Now, Mises was a good writer. He was not an incompetent writer by anybody's standards. But some men have an ability to think in a systematic fashion. And other men have an ability to communicate verbally, or at least on paper, with such great clarity that what they write sticks in your mind. Murray Rothbard had both. He was a systematic thinker in a way that very few people of any period of time have ever been. He had the ability to communicate on a piece of paper almost better than any economist who has ever lived. Some might say Bon Viverk had that ability. I would say yes, he did. But he was very narrow in the topics he addressed. Rothbard was at the other end of the spectrum. He addressed all of the issues with enormous clarity. And not just clarity but with rhetorical skill to drive his point home into your mind where you won't forget it. Most people do not have that skill. So he took this body of literature, that is the writings of Mises, and he began to put them in a format and defend them intellectually in a way much more powerful than Mises himself could defend his own position because Mises was not gifted rhetorically in the way that Murray Rothbard was. Now you've got to understand, and you don't understand, and I really didn't understand until within the last 12 months in thinking about it, that Mises gave us this comprehensive, broad, sweeping economic theory tied to a handful of axioms and corollaries in which economics is a sweeping whole could be attained in one volume. Fat as it is, human action covers what needs to be covered. 
And prior to human action, or prior certainly to Mises' writings in German, there was nothing else like it. There were textbooks, conventional textbooks, never systematically developed, never all-encompassing, never providing basic axioms that could be applied across the board. There were monographs, first-rate monographs that were available. There were some powerful writings that economists had produced over the years, but nothing on a scale in terms of its comprehensive nature that was equal to human action. Rothbard took human action and all of the other materials that Mises had written and put it into a format that an intelligent person who is willing to sit and read can grasp. This was an enormous skill. Then what he did, if you look at man, economy, and state, is that he brought the whole corpus of Mises' writings to bear on specific aspects of economic theory. And if you look to the footnotes, you find that in those footnotes, he has addressed most of the modern world of economics, except perhaps for the rigorously mathematical stuff that he knew nobody was going to read anyway, although he could but didn't bother to do. He addressed all of this material so that in 1962, a beginning amateur in libertarian thought could, if he had the ability and a good enough library, to pursue all of those ideas by means of the footnotes that Murray provided. Now, if you have read Mises, you may notice that he is long on exposition and short on footnotes. And part of it was, in Mises' own mind, he felt his own exposition was a whole lot better than the footnotes. Murray thought the same of Mises, but did us the favor of saying, let me show you that there is support material here. And so the footnotes became a kind of gold mine for any person starting out in 1962 trying to master the Austrian theory. He was clear. He was rhetorically powerful. And he did what scholars in my generation and even in your generation were told you must never, ever do. He put important ideas in italics so you could spot them. <laughs> that is considered outside the realm of scholarship. And yet Murray put them in when they were needed. And if you want to review something and get the idea, Murray in a very gentle and in a very, I think, gentlemanly way, put things in italics to say, here, dummy, review it. <laughs> And there were plenty of dummies out there who needed to review it, and of those, I was chief. And so it makes reading easier. I have, by the way, copied his style for many years, and from time to time have been, have been accused of misusing the italics, but I've found something interesting. I am attacked very often by people, and they are smart enough to attack my italics. Usually when people don't like what I have written, they have understood what I have written. It's a great advantage. You make it clear to them so at least they know what they don't like. <laughs> now, if you have read other materials of Rothbard, you know that he integrated economic theory with the writing of history, with historiography. He wrote superb economic history, and we could tell that immediately First of all, from an academic standpoint, and the only really dry thing he ever wrote was his doctoral dissertation on the Panic of 1819, but it's readable and intelligent and was well received by the academic community. Then, months later, America's Great Depression, which was hated and panned and rejected because it said that Herbert Hoover made the Depression worse. And then at the very end said, and what Hoover did was just getting started compared with what Roosevelt did. And that made the Democrats as mad as the first part of the book made the Republicans angry. 
So he killed off his audience on all sides almost immediately. That book was ignored for literally 20 years. And finally, probably the finest, if not the finest historian of our generation, the, the best writing historian of our generation, Paul Johnson, in his book Modern Times, gets to the Great Depression and relies almost exclusively on America's Great Depression. So it took 20 years for a distinguished academic to figure out that Murray was right. But of all the historians of the 20th century that I would say I want to convince, Paul Johnson is that historian. And Murray convinced him. He wrote revisionist history. Murray was great on revisionist history. He would come against the prevailing interpretations in terms of Misesian principles of economic analysis. He also did what all economists, including Mises, did not want to do. He began to raise the issues of ethics and its relationship to economics. And that was because he called himself, I think accurately, an Aristotelian. He believed in natural rights. He believed in natural law. He believed that the state violated the principles of both natural rights and natural law. And Mises and other economists, of the, certainly the Chicago School, would never make that kind of statement. They wanted a value-free economics. And Murray pursued value-free economics, but what he found again and again is that if you pursued the concept of freedom, you found over and over that this was a means of defending natural rights. It should not be violated. Mises would not have said that. Certainly, I can't think of anybody at the University of Chicago who would base his reputation on that idea. So he was truly a maverick. He then challenged the critics of Austrian theory in a way that Mises did not. He replied to them on, on issues of epistemology, on issues of interpretation. He would go into the scholarly journals in the early years and he'd fight and he fought well. He would take on anybody and if the journal would publish the article, Murray would write the article. He was not afraid to interact with his peers despite the fact that every time he did it, he was presenting himself as a maverick a defender of what was regarded at the time as a dead system to the extent that anyone remembered Austrian economics they regarded it as a dead system and so he was he was hammering down nails into his own career coffin and he did not care so he would defend the system now in later years he chose not to interact into the scholarly journals because in later years, they'd so completely forgotten about Mises and Austrianism that he had nothing really to react against. But in the early years, in the 50s and the early 60s, he still did. He was not afraid to mix it up. It's a tremendous conceptual legacy that he spun almost single-handed. Almost. Mises being the giant on whose shoulders Murray stood. But there was no other comparable giant. Organizational. Now, now this gets into an area you don't, of course, see in the published materials. You have to take my word for it. Organizationally, he was, in one sense, a lightning rod, but he was, a, like with any flash of light, he was a very bright light. Now, there's an old saying that bright lights attract large bugs. <laughs> and Murray attracted his share of large bugs, as any early movement will attract. If you read the history, for example, of the Fabian movement in England, uh, there were some exceedingly large bugs who were attracted because it's an offbeat position and offbeat people tend to be attracted to it. But Murray attracted young scholars. I can see one of them in the room today. I won't point him out, but he is no longer a young scholar. <laughs> but Murray attracted him, and there were others like him. He attracted beyond the personal very intelligent readers who understood the magnitude of what he was saying and, and f 
realized in their own lives that he could not get this kind of help from anyone else. And so they began to read more and more of what Murray wrote, and he wrote so much, so amazingly much. He, he was a one-man clearinghouse. And I've listed of the three things, a clearinghouse of ideas, of footnotes, and talent. And he would put people of considerable gifts into contact with each other. This was a day before there was a web. He would do it by the fact that bright kids were coming. He knew the, so many of them. He would put them in contact with each other. He would help them with their reading. He would give bibliographical information that was just extraordinary. Uh, this man made it possible for a group of disciples to get their feet on the ground epistemologically and intellectually. Now, Mises did the same. Mises performed that role after World War I in Vienna with the Mises Circle. And Hayek was attracted, and Rupke was attracted. He picked off some of the best and the brightest of his generation and pulled them out of socialism. But Murray did this not from a strong position institutionally, but from essentially no position institutionally. Mises at least had a position, a paid position, in the Austrian Chamber of Commerce. Murray was fortunate to get jobs writing book reviews and getting little grants here and there from underfunded libertarian organizations of which there were only a handful anyway. He created a sense of camaraderie. This I know from a later period, but I've, I've had it told to me again and again by young men who were influenced by him. And that's fun. Camaraderie is a good thing. And he was an optimist. You always hear the phrase, or at least in my generation you did, attached to Hubert Humphrey of the happy warrior. Murray was the happy warrior. He really was a happy warrior. He, he was always laughing. He always had a good word to say. Uh, and even when he beat up on people verbally, it was always usually always in a lighthearted manner. Uh, devastating, but lighthearted. I always appreciated that. <laughs> and he was motivational. People, people were so impressed by what he did, and almost no one realized really how much he did. But even in what they saw of what he did, it motivated him. He was a model for them. Uh, and he encouraged our, us to do this. Tremendous benefit for, for a young man starting out. And we could say, yeah, but it's so tough out there, Murray. Tough like Murray? We were getting there in the 60s when there were at least publishers for this material. He was doing this in the early 50s and earlier even earlier, in the 40s, before he found Mises. So let's talk about the liabilities, especially in this earlier period, 56 when he got his doctorate to 65, when things began to change. Intellectually, he was an Aristotelian in an age of Kant. He was a deductivist, as he showed in his writing in defending Mises, in an age of empiricism. He went to axioms of human action, and the entire profession went to statistical correlations to prove their points. As I've said, he, as in Mises's phrase, Murray came, like Mises, in the name of apodictic certainty, that great phrase of, Mur of Mises's, apodictic certainty, in the middle of an era of almost complete relativism. An era in which, really, the only certainty was the speed of light. And everything else was up for grabs. He used verbal logic in presenting his case instead of mathematics. He wrote for popular journals instead of academic journals. He did all the things that you're not supposed to do to advance your career within a brilliance that he had of not advancing his career. I mean, he was a specialist in the division of labor in not advancing his career. 
Now think of the climate of opinion. He was, a, he was surrounded by leftists, and I don't mean just leftists at the university. I mean, he was surrounded by leftists of all of his relatives. Everybody he knew except for his father, everybody he knew was debating the real issue of the 1940s, and that is Stalin versus Trotsky. And he said that was it. That was the sweep of public opinion in the public in which he traveled. And he said, you know, they would, they would, he didn't use the word excommunicate, but that's what it meant. They would excommunicate each other. And here he is with his father, here he is, defending the idea that the state should be removed. He didn't trust the state. Now he arrives on the scene, he's got, he, he, he goes with human action. Well, it's a, it's, it's a comprehensive treatise. And the one thing you don't write in the modern world is a comprehensive treatise. You can write textbooks, but you don't write a comprehensive treatise. You don't write an Adam Smith type book. Because that's, oh no, 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 no. You can't do that because you have to know too much. You have to know too many facts. Empirically, you have to make too many statistical correlations. No one can make statistical correlations outside of narrow topics suitable for detailed footnoted monographs. And Murray walks into this and says, I think I'm going to write Man, Economy, and State, in which I'm going to tell you about everything with the footnotes to prove it. Not de rigueur in academic circles in 1950s through the early 60s. He was living in an age of Keynes. He despised Keynes' position. He was living in an age of central banking. He was convinced that central banking was a gigantic cartel that was created by capitalists who were using the state to advance their personal economic positions. You go try to find that even today in a standard economic textbook. Look up Federal Reserve System and you're not going to find it under the chapter dealing with cartels. <laughs> he, was a, he was a man who believed in non-intervention, non-coercion, non-violence in the era of the Cold War. He was a man who believed in local sovereignty, local responsibility in an era of the United Nations. And all of it was in New York, and so was Murray. And he latches on to Ludwig von Mises, the number one pariah of the economic community. The guy you don't want to touch with the 10-foot pole, and Murray's sitting around there with three-foot poles. He didn't care, except he wanted to defend the truth. Now look at his occupational situation. Here he is in New York City. He can't leave New York City. That's because Murray at that stage suffered from a kind of phobia. And I don't know what you call phobia about crossing the East River, but that's what the phobia he had. He couldn't leave New York City. He'd get panicky. He couldn't go up in an elevator more than about what? Maybe five stories at most, and he couldn't leave New York City. He was structured in. He was pushed down. He couldn't leave. He didn't get a job until late at Brooklyn Polytechnic, a bunch of engineers, and no graduate school. There was no old boy network to get him a job because in the Austrian school, there was just one old boy. <laughs> so there was no way to do what I call the calling by means of an occupation, or almost no way. I define the calling, you can write this down, as the most important thing that you can do in which you would be most difficult to replace. That's your calling. Now, it's usually not your job. Your job is how you put food on the table. But the calling is the most important thing you can do in which be most difficult to replace. Murray believed that his calling was to extend Austrian economic theory and the defense of the free market 
as an ethical ideal and extend both of those to an analysis of the whole sweep of modern civilization. History, sociology, politics. And when, when Murray talked politics, it wasn't just local, it wasn't just state, national. You, he could give you facts and figures on all of it. Now, how did he do it? Well, he had advantages. He was very, very smart. And he had an extraordinary memory. And if you check his footnotes, you'll see the extent to which he had an extraordinary memory. He always had the ability to go to the central issue in a debate. He, he, it was as if he was just pushing off the extremities to get to that, that core issue. The only thing I've seen like it in sports from my generation was a defensive giant by the name of Big Daddy Lipscomb, who was a terror in professional football. And they asked him once, they, they said, Big Daddy, how is it that you get so many sacks against the quarterback? And he said, it's not so hard. I just go in and I tear off all the people around the quarterback till I get them. <laughs> That's what Murray does with an argument. All of the defensive paraphernalia, all of the offensive linemen on the other side of the team, he just he's, he just picks it off and goes right to the right to the quarterback. Saxon. That was his gift. Now Mises did not have it to that extent. Mises was smart. But Murray was a master of simply publicly either decapitating or disemboweling the opponent. And they never liked to come back twice. He wrote clearly. He wrote continuously. He wrote for almost anyone who would give him an opportunity to put an idea in print. That was an advantage because he got disciples. People came to him because he never stopped writing and he had, he had the option of going out for tiny little newsletters and tiny little magazines for either no money or hardly any money and he did it, he had those outlets and was able to recruit a generation of disciples. We just didn't pay him any money. It was part of his calling, it wasn't part of his job. Now he had Mises as an advantage. Now that's an advantage. That's way up there on the list of advantages. Because Mises by then, by 1949, had, had human action in print, and he had socialism in print, and the theory of money and credit was in print. So the basics of the position, Murray did have access to. And it wasn't just that Murray read them. Murray mastered them, internalized them, brought them into the way he thought, and then applied them. Tremendous advantage. Mises was in New York City because he had fled from Nazi Germany, or at least he'd fled Nazi Germany, then he went to Switzerland, then he fled from Switzerland, he came here, and he had the seminar, the weekly seminar, graduate seminar, which he would allow non-enrolled students to attend, and Murray attended. That was a tremendous advantage. He was curious. It never stopped. Everything was grist for Murray's mill. He would get excited about some of the strangest things that almost anybody could imagine. And yet he'd make them interesting. And he'd tie them to Austrian economic principles. Uh, he was a great conspiracy theorist. And he believed... <laughs> He believed in it because it was consistent with Austrianism. And basically it says, you start with methodological individualism, which means that individuals act to improve their situations. And therefore, these great impersonal social forces are mythical. Well, that's consistent with the Austrian position. And Murray believed that. So he said, if you want to find out why people do something, either ask them or see what they've written and then follow the money. And then he looked to the state and he, and he perceived the state 
as an oppressive agency, but an oppression that could be used to feather one's own nest. So then he said, oh, they're going to see what people are doing in terms of establishing state power. Follow the money. And he followed the money. Now this, let me tell you, you want a suicidal pill academically, you adopt conspiracy theories. Unless you're a Marxist. Now if you're a Marxist, you get to do it. Because you're a Marxist. But nobody else is supposed to do it. And Murray did it. Killing himself, in a sense, academically. He would challenge anybody. And yet, the optimism and the laughter and the good nature all were advantages that most of us don't have. He also had what no one talks about but was important, the Volcker Fund. The Volcker Fund was the one large source of libertarian money until the mid-60s. And he did get some money from them. He wrote book reviews. He wrote position papers. I can tell you, if you want to be systematically humiliated, all you have to do is go up to the third floor of this building and look at the file cabinets of Murray Rothbard's letters and memoranda. Whacked out on his manual typewriter and sent out in voluminous quantities to anyone and everyone and to the Volcker organization. And we are talking not one filing cabinet. We are talking stacks of filing cabinets of materials that in many cases were suitable for publication right then. And the only thing in all of it that even vaguely can cheer me up is the fact that he would use X's to cross out stuff in his articles. X, 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 X. Which meant at least he didn't get it perfect the first time. Okay. And I, the, that's the, I call that the X-rated Rothbard. Is that at least he was, he was human enough that he put those X's in. But that was about the only thing that even showed a trace of normality in his academic ability. He married the right, he married the right woman. I think that is as, as large a factor as one can imagine. If he hadn't had the support of his wife, I'm, I'm not sure that he could have been equally productive. Now, beginning in 65, it began to change. And I've, I've basically boiled it down to two things. First is the Vietnam War, and the other thing was stagflation. The Vietnam War was a trauma in American academic life and social life generally because it created enormous doubts in the wisdom of politicians among the brightest and best of America, the students who were coming up. They began to lose faith in the state. They began to lose faith in public pronouncements by politicians. They lost faith in the establishment because they were being drafted to go to a war they did not believe in. They lost faith on the campus in the reigning paradigms of the age. The old liberalism did not survive two things. Two things killed it. One was the assassination of Kennedy. The can-do liberalism got shot down, literally killed, as an emblem of the old can-do liberalism. State-run liberalism died. And then within months you had the escalation of the war. And the, the faith began to crack. There was a revived interest in conspiracy theories during this period. Not widespread, but much more widespread than had existed in 1963. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the Kennedy movie, the JFK movie, is kind of a living testament to a conspiracy theory of the assassination. And you know how many of them there are. They are, they are truly a dime a dozen. There are lots of conspiracy theories. But they were never popular among the general public until the assassination of Kennedy. And after that, they became popular. And then there was stagflation of the 70s when inflation, which was supposed to cut unemployment, did not cut unemployment. And the Phillips curve got kicked way, way out to the right. In other words, it, the, the old idea that if you just inflated to 5 or 6%, you could reduce unemployment to 4% or 5%. We were then getting inflation, expansion of money, 
in double-digit figures, and you had stagnation, you had a recession with Nixon, you had a recession with Ford, and then finally when they began to finally tighten the money supply in 1979, it led to the beginning of the recession of 1980 and 81. And finally the old Keynesian paradigm began to lose adherence because all of the genius of the economists could not get prices down and could not get the unemployment rate down. It was the end of the Phillips curve. It was the end of Bretton Woods, the agreement on gold. Nixon closes the gold window. Prices skyrocket. The dollar begins to decline. It was all the things that the Austrians said would happen, but nobody cared. And now people we're ready to listen, more people than ever before. And Murray was ready to go with articles, pamphlets, lectures, all of it. He, he had done the groundwork when everybody hated it. He had written Man, Economy, and State. He had written America's Great Depression. I mean, the basic groundwork with supporting materials he had personally written. And now somebody, more and more at least, somebody was willing to listen. He had done his work when there was no thanks for it. And he was ready. He was prepared for intellectual combat, trained, skilled, battle ready. Battle ready when the Vietnam War of the 60s and the stagflation of the 70s began to undermine people's faith in the prevailing Keynesian worldview and the prevailing Cold War worldview of that generation. He had done the work. He was ready for battle. He had written everything you were supposed to write. He had done the book reviews. He did the newsletter. Uh, the, the, the Triple R, Rothbard, Rockwell Report. He did all that. He did what you were supposed to do, win or lose, but most people won't do it. If you don't have the big win out there, they won't sacrifice to do the work. He did the work. Now look at what we've got. He did not live to see the Internet. He died about a year before it took off. He did not live to see LewRockwell.com. didn't see Mises Org. He would have loved it. And if somebody had shown him a way to get an electric typewriter to type into it, he would have participated. <laughs> but he respected it. Look at the situation today. For $10 a month, or for real cheapskates, $5 a month, you can put your own website up. You got something to say, you can say it. You want to do a blog, you can blog it. You've got articles to publish, books to publish. You can get online, and Google will eventually attract it. People will find you. And this, in operation, is what Albert J. Nock called the remnant in that famous essay, Isaiah's Job. They will find you. The line of the generation that you're more familiar with, if we build it, they will come. Now, there may not be a lot of them. And you may not be good enough to attract and keep a lot of them. But if you build it, some will come. And one thing is clear, if you don't build it, none will come. <laughs> the number of journals now, academic journals, the number of publishing houses that are willing to take libertarian, anti-state, shrink the state books and manuscripts and publish them if they're good enough, the number of outlets that we have today is just extraordinary compared with what it was when Murray Rothbard was in high school or college. It's, it's not the same world. 
Now, the advantage Rothbard had was that he didn't have this gigantic amount of material to master. He had Mises to master, and that's certainly a good start. Even Murray couldn't keep up with today's output, and neither can you, but give it a try. You can't read every article. You can't read every free e-letter that comes down the pike. You cannot read all of the articles that are published just within lewrockwellandmises.org, let alone other sites that will give you supporting material. You can't read all the books that are published. You can't subscribe to all the magazines that will reinforce your position. The disadvantage is you're always going to be behind. But the advantage is your weaponry will be much more effective because you can find articles that you need. You can find the background material in a three billion page free online encyclopedia that the web is and Google enables you to access. You can find a community of people who hold to ideas, that you can get the division of labor. And if one guy does one topic and does it well, he'll get a few disciples and they'll work on that end of it. Whether it's labor economics, whether it's central banking, whether it's the history of cartels, whether it's monopoly theory, you will find people now because of the enormous effect of the web and the enormous effect of materials that are first-rate materials that you can gain access to, you can begin to extend this work, even though it's a relatively small group. You can't take over the world, but you can inflict damage while we're waiting. <laughs> As someone told me years ago, you can't fight City Hall, but you can pee on the steps and run. <laughs> now, you have been given this enormous advantage that Rothbard is behind you. Mises is behind you. Seminars are available for you to come and get this stuff boiled down. This didn't exist 40 years ago. And surely it didn't exist 50 years ago when Rothbard was coming online. You can do a great deal, even though it doesn't seem like much. You can be part of an enormous division of labor a social division of labor, an intellectual division of labor, which it was too expensive to do as recently as 25 years ago. And now you can do it. And that's what I would tell you to do. Specialize in one area where you really have confidence that you're making a difference. And if somebody wants to know something about that area, he comes to you. Not because you're loud, not because of anything except you put it online, it's coherent, it's meaningful, and people who want to find out about it will come to your site. And yet, you must also do what Rothbard did. You must keep a broad picture. You can't just specialize. You've got to apply these principles, not as a specialist, but as an accomplished amateur a gifted amateur, you apply the same principles across the board and you keep working at it. And if, somebody, if nobody ever comes to ask you your opinion, that's not your fault. It's because they just never came. And Murray worked in that situation for years. Nobody came. Nobody cared. And then things changed and he was in a position to begin to have influence. Each of you should look in your own situation, your own area of specialty, that thing, that calling, that most important thing in which you would be most difficult to replace, each of you has that niche somewhere. Find out where it is, 
and begin doing the grunt work. You got to do the grunt work, but it sure is easier to do it with the web than ever before. And the tool is there. Don't walk away from the tool. Interact. Read the, the, the Mises materials. Read anything you can find on the web that helps you develop two things. Real knowledge of a specialty in which you will make a difference to somebody else. And secondly, the broad sweep of information which enables you to comment at least intelligently, though not as an expert, but a comment intelligently because you're applying these fundamental principles to specific situations. There are not many people you think who are in this room. If each of you wrote three articles or five articles in the next five years and you stayed in communication with each other, just keeping up with each other in this room would keep you very busy. And it can be done at almost no cost because of the web. So that's what I would tell you to do. Go and do thou likewise. You will not be as gifted as Rothbard. You will not write man economy and state. You will not write, I guarantee you, you will not write a monograph as revolutionary and yet as accurate as America's Great Depression, even if you work real hard. And you know the great thing about it? You don't have to, because it got done. It's been done. Been there, read that. But what you can do is to go where no one else you know has gone and hardly anybody else is interested in and nobody really wants to focus on it and you can niche that. And you can, you can own it. You can make that yours. And if all you do is put up a web with links to all the other websites or articles or materials, if all you are is a clearinghouse on the web, you are doing something tremendously important. You're reducing other people's difficulties in locating information. You are participating in the intellectual division of labor. That's my, that's my call to you. It's my challenge to you. When you go out of here, when you leave this conference, you've had it poured into you. Now what's going to come out? You've had enormous benefits poured into you. You've had advantages given to you. And you have just whether you know it or not, increased your personal level of responsibility. And you can't avoid that because you've been here. It's too late. Now go apply it. I don't know where you're going to do it. I don't know what your major is. I don't know what your interest is. But whatever it is that you really love and which would be most difficult to replace, get online, get, get used to writing, Crank the stuff out. If you need to revise it, you don't even need the X's. You just need the delete key. Murray may not have liked modern technology, but I really believe he would have loved the delete key. <laughs> we have the delete key. It's time for everybody in this room. Not tonight. I may not. I mean, you, I give you a week. <laughs> But everybody here either ought to be online with his own website or participating in a joint effort by the time you graduate from whatever program you're in. When you walk out of that program, you better have something online. And if you're an undergraduate looking for a graduate degree and a graduate fellowship and you can say, here's what I've done, and it's online and you can see it, that's an advantage. That's, that's an edge in a highly competitive market. You go out to get that job and you can say, I've got my own website. You can take a look at it. You can see what I've done. That is a competitive advantage. So that's my challenge. Go and do thou likewise. <laughs>